Hello everybody. My name is Prentice Boxdale. And I hope that you have you enjoying this YouTube channel. Will you please hit the subscribe and like button? And y'all are gonna have a hallelujah good time, but we got many more to come. And let's have a good time together. Hey, hello.
delighted to be able to introduce a young man this morning, a very smart young man in the gospel, in the books, and he's a Christian. I know his mother and father, Brother Barry, John Barry, and Teresa are proud of their sons, one in college at MTSU, and one has finished college, can speak five different languages. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I've been told that I have about 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. All I can say is uh, nobody look at your phones, cover up your watches. Right. <laughs> uh, it's always an honor to come up here, and I like to thank the leadership for giving me an opportunity to speak today. Yes. And hopefully something that, through something that I say, the Church of Christ can be edified and Man. God will be glorified. Come on. So today, my topic is the top five underrated sins. Now if, I don't know how many of you guys watch YouTube, mm. but some of y'all are looking a little older, but I'm not going to say who. You're eating that. <laughs> But there's this YouTube channel called Watch Mojo where they make top 10 and top 5 lists of different things. All right. They'll have top 10 saddest moments on TV or top 10 best TV couples All or right. top 10 songs from musicals or mm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And you watch the video and you know you're all excited to see, oh, did that song I really like make the list? Mm. Is it going to be number one? And it's sort of interesting. So I thought that I'd do something like that, but except with our vices, because oftentimes I think we get this idea about the world that behind every problem yeah. is somebody out there laughing maniacally, rubbing their hands together, mm. about to press the big red button and kill everybody. Mm. But most of the time, evil doesn't really look like that. Right. What evil actually looks like is people not taking time to think about their actions and how those actions have consequences so no. and how that might affect the other people around us. So coming in at number five on our list of the top five under, most underrated sins is getting a second opinion. What do I mean by getting a second opinion? I mean, a lot of times we already have instructions from God, right. but we don't like the instructions because they're hard. Yeah. So we try to find somebody else or something else yes. that's going to give us an alternative route so that we don't have to do this hard thing that we just got saddled with. If you think about it, the first sin that we ever had, right, was this sin, getting a second opinion. Adam and Eve already knew. Yeah. They had instructions. Yeah, so, so. Don't eat the fruit. Not that fruit. Any other fruit will do, but not this one. Yeah, if so. you eat it, you will die. And all it took was somebody else slithering up mm. and whispering in their ear and saying, actually, you're not going to die. If you eat this, yeah. you'll be a god. Mm -hmm. And then you know how we do. We get to thinking about it. And we say, you know what? That might be fun. That might be good. It might not be that bad if I just do it once. And then we're down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. So follow me, if you would, to sec to 1 Kings chapter 13. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. All right. I really love the Old Testament, and I know you guys know that by now. <laughs> because that's where all the violence and the gore and the mayhem okay. and the real life is. All right. So let's look at verses 7 through 9. I'm not going to read this whole... That's the first one. First Kings 13. Oh. First Kings chapter 13, verses 7 through 9. I'll read this real quick. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. 
For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again, by the same way that thou camest. Now these seem like pretty hard instructions to me. Yeah. If you are a prophet, you don't have any money, you're probably not even wearing shoes, you're walking for miles and miles, no water, no water or food carrying with you, right? And he says, don't stop at anybody's house to eat or a drink. And right. don't go back the same way that you came. So take the long way home. Mm. That's rough instructions. That's not easy. And a lot of the time we don't have a reason explicitly stated for what God told us to do. And it's not hard. I mean, and it's not easy. But we still have to deal with it. We scroll on down to verse 15. I'm going to keep reading till 24 in that same chapter. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. So another, pro so to give you the background, we've got this prophet, told him don't go home. Well, told him don't stop at anybody's house. Don't stop to eat. Don't get anything to drink. Don't go back the same way that you came. Right. And now we've got another man that comes up like you do in the Middle East and says, Oh, you want to come inside? Yeah. Get something to eat? Get something to drink? I bet you're tired. Right? And he said, I may not return with right. thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. Don't the instructions always flash back in our mind when we're about to do something stupid? <laughs> Didn't Eve rattle off exactly what God told her as soon as she heard it? This is how you know when you're going off down the wrong track. Because those instructions, what God already told you, what you know that you're supposed to be doing, it pops up in your head. There's no way it doesn't. You think, okay, I remember I was supposed to go here, do this, and do this. But this new thing seems more fun, and it's not too long before you lose track of what you were doing. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet, also as thou art. And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto yeah. him. Have we ever let people's reputation convince us of stuff oh, over yeah. God? Well, he has a master's degree. I guess he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Or yeah, he's been in church for 10 yeah. years, so yeah. I guess maybe I could listen to him. I might have been wrong. You know, maybe I heard this wrong. We can't let that little stuff get in our heads. When you get your instructions from God, yes, sir. we can look through this whole book. He's never come back again and changed his mind yes, sir. and said, okay, I didn't really mean it. But oftentimes, we like to think that maybe, just maybe, he did. Or maybe this one time, it's not going to matter, and I can go back to doing it right. So he went back with him, and did eat bread yeah. in his house, and drank water. And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. Right. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread, and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come into the sepulchre of thy fathers. That's pretty rough. So just because he did not... Well, just because he didn't follow the instructions, and instead he decided to have a meal, yeah. which seems sort of innocuous, except it's somebody's hospitality, he ends up dead. Because if you go down to verse 24, right. you see that he gets eaten by a lion yeah. when he's on his way back home, out of nowhere. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to get eaten by a lion if you act a fool. Right. Mm. But I am saying that God is displeased with you 
when you already have instructions from him and you decide to take a second opinion because we all know that God has never come back and changed his mind. Amen. Remember, Paul even said that, he, that if an angel comes down and tells yes, you sir. something else, yes, don't go for it. The Bible is finished. There's no more new prophets coming out of the woodworks. We've got what we've, we've got our word to live yes, on, and we've got to stick with it. So coming in at number four, we're going to go to Leviticus here. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Please don't fall asleep on me. I know that I said Leviticus. <laughs> and I know Leviticus is really dry. But I promise I'm only going to read three verses out of it. Is everybody there? Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all of the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. So most of us know this story, right? Aaron's sons were supposed to offer fire to the Lord. And whatever kind of fire they brought, it wasn't the fire that God asked for. Amen. And so he killed them. But what I want to focus on there is before Aaron could speak up and say, Wait, you just killed my sons. Why? Moses said, remember what God said. He said, God said, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh unto me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. What does that mean? Coming in at number four is not giving God his special status. God does not want the same stuff that you give other people. He wants the stuff that you give him to be special. No, no. Whether that's your time or whether that's your worship service, he doesn't want you to just sing like you're in the shower. Yeah. He wants what you got. Because when you sanctify something, right, it means it's special. It's different from all the rest. Yeah. Holy ground isn't just normal ground. The church is consecrated. This is a place where we come close to God. And if you want to come close to God, you've got to give him something special. Yes, you can't just offer him any kind of thing. Right. But oftentimes, that's what we want to do. For instance, when we talk about the Lord's Supper, this is a big deal. That's the main reason, it's the main reason that we assemble here together, right? right? To remember Jesus like he told us to. But if you get on your phone, or you start putting together right, your right. shopping list, or you start thinking about the game later today, is this time that you were supposed to set aside for God, did you sanctify it? Is it special? Did you actually give it to him? Does he want what you got. If you had been offering God this fire, would you still be alive later? Lord have mercy. So coming in at number four is not setting aside things to be special for God. All right. Not giving God his special status. Instead, sometimes we treat him like everybody else in our life. When we know that since he's God, if we want to get close to him, we should be rolling out the red carpet. God shouldn't be at the end of our finances. He should be at the beginning of our finances. He shouldn't be at the end of our time. He should be the first thing that we block off time for. Yes, sir. And everything else comes second. Yes, sir. But if you give God half-hearted stuff, yes, he's not pleased. Amen. So that's number four. Now, coming in at number three is our scripture from Acts chapter 12, verses 21 through 23. And that's taking all the credit after he helps you out of a tight spot. Mm. 
Now see, since I'm basing this off of like a YouTube video, I had to give you Acts chapter 12 as like the thumbnail, you know, the little picture you see before you actually click on the video, shows you something in the middle, tries to grab your attention, the clickbait. Clickbait. The clickbait, so I'll read that one more time. Acts chapter 12, verses 21 through 23. And upon a set day, Herod, arranged in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god, and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms, yeah. and gave up the ghost. Have we ever, has God ever gotten us through something that we didn't think we were going to get out of? And then we forgot? Yeah. And then we thought that we did it. When you didn't have any money, but all the bills still got paid. Well. When you didn't have any gas, but you still made it home that day. When you only had five loaves and two fish, but everybody got fed. Yeah. Sometimes we get bigger than ourselves after God has picked us up off the floor. We forget where we came from and where we just were. Yeah. And then when we get to the next giant, we want to tremble and ask him again and say, well, I don't yeah. know if he can help me through this. But we have to always think back to David's battle with Goliath. That it wasn't the, that it wasn't the stones. That it wasn't the sling. That it wasn't his upper body strength and his years of training. That it was because God was with him that he was able to slay the giant. And after he slayed the giant, and before he slayed the giant, he acknowledged that he was able to do this through the power of God. Amen. Remember, when they asked him, how are you going to go up against this giant? He said, when I was taking care of the sheep, there came a lion and a bear. Yeah. And God was with me, and I was able to kill the lion and the bear. So this is just another lion or another bear. So we have to remember that, yes, God will help us through stuff. But when he does help us through stuff, he wants the glory. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want you to take it and say you got here all by yourself, yes, mm -hmm. which is why he lets you get so low. He wants you to be so low that you have to say, there was no way that I did that. The only way I got out was because God was with me. But sometimes, after he brings us out and we get high again, we forget that he brought us out. Yes, and we sir. think, maybe, just maybe, it was just me. You know, I'm so big, I'm so strong, I came through X, Y, and Z. But it's not just you. God is with you. So remember, number three, not giving God his credit after he helps you out. So moving on, moving right along to number two, from Genesis 18, verses 1 through 5. I know, I like to do a lot of reading, that's just who I am. <laughs> but it's the word of God, you should be excited, right? You should be jumping up and down. I hear they used to stand up all day and read this stuff. So does anyone want to read those first five verses of Genesis chapter 18 for me? And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamea. Mamea. Mama. And, excuse me? Go ahead. That's and he is. sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he left, lift up his eyes and looked. And lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from my servant, thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and conform and, conf and conform and comfort you for a heart 
uh, uh, comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. Thank you. All right, I know. He just read out of the Old Testament. Y'all fell asleep. You picked up your phone. You went on Facebook. You thought about lunch. So we'll sum it up a little bit. Abraham comes outside and he sees three strange men. He doesn't know where they're from, but he invites them in because that's the tradition. That's what you do yeah. in their culture. He says, oh, let me wash your feet. Let me get you some food. Let me f let me take care of you. You know, get you something, get you something nice to eat. Make sure that you're okay. They're supposed to do this back and forth dance where one of them invites the other and they say, oh no, I couldn't possibly. And they say, oh, I insist, I insist, come stay with us. You know, hospitality. All right. Yeah. But apparently there are some people around here that are not practicing this. And that's why they are here. Because it turns out the three men are angels, yeah. and they've come to investigate what they've been hearing about. Mm -hmm. If you scroll down yeah. to verses 20 and 21, the, And the Lord said, The cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done yeah. altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. Now, we often like to go here for homosexuality, but that's a little boring, so we're pushing that off the table. There's something here that we miss a lot of the time, and I missed it a lot too, until I came back and read. So flip over to chapter 19. I'm only going to read four verses out of here, the first three, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 9 of Genesis chapter 19. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. What did they say they were looking for? They said, we came down because we heard these people were bad. How bad are they? They're so bad that you can come out and sit in the street in front of their house and they won't invite you in for nothing to eat. Right? Because everywhere else in the Bible, when you see somebody sitting out in the street, what did they do? They said, oh, come in. Let me wash your feet. Let me take care of you. Because you have to understand, put in perspective, this isn't Nashville. If, some, if a bum shows up in Sodom and Gomorrah, you saw them. This city has a front and a back door. We're talking maybe a couple hundred people. Intense. It's like if somebody sat on your street and they were sleeping on the sidewalk and you drove past them and you said, oh, I didn't see them out there. Yes, you did. Yeah. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. So we know this story, right? The men gang up on them, and they threaten to rape these two angels that just came in. And then the angels smite them with blindness, and they leave the city. But look at verse 9. Does anybody have one of the newer translations of the Bible for Genesis 19.9? Verse yeah, nine. read that for me, just verse 9. Stand back, they shouted. This fellow who came to town is outside, and now he's acting like our judge. We'll treat you far worse than those other men. And they lunged toward life to break down the door. Did you, did you catch that? You're not from here either. You don't belong here no. either. See, they wanted to humiliate these guys and make them leave the city because they don't belong. They're foreign. Think about it for a second. What's the first thing 
that lets you notice that somebody's not from here in the United States, right? They have an accent, they might eat some weird food, they might have a different skin tone, their hair doesn't look like our hair, right? So you have to remember that Abraham and Lot were walking through a bunch of different countries on foot. They didn't speak the native language. They probably didn't look like the other people that they were bumping into. And this wasn't exactly a place where you get your visa and come in at the border, right? They yeah. just come in and pitch their tent here. It's pretty obvious that Lot does not belong in this city. So that brings me to my number two, which is being inhospitable. Have you ever tried to make somebody feel unwelcome? Have you ever tried to scare them off? Have you ever had somebody try to humiliate you and make you feel like you didn't belong here so that you would leave? Sometimes we do this unintentionally just by being snippy and yeah. rude. But it must be a big deal because God was willing to wipe a whole bunch of cities off the face of the earth yeah. for being rude to people. Because we know that as Christians, if people come near us, we should make them feel like they belong. Because we know how it feels not to belong. Because that's our whole story. So we should be careful when the way we treat people to make sure that we don't make anybody else feel like that. And so, before I unveil my top pick, a few honorable mentions because that's what they do on Watch Mojo. They point out some really good ones that they didn't put on the list. So, wanting forgiveness while refusing to forgive others. Okay. Not believing that God will provide for you. Not setting aside any time for God. Not praying for others. And wasting God's time or resources. Mm. Are all things that we are sometimes guilty of, but don't think too hard on most of the time because they're not really as big as murder or adultery, but they're still just as bad. Amen. So now, for my top pick, okay. and then I'll finally sit down. I know y'all are tired of me. Okay. Coming in at number one is not stepping up when you see a chance to do good. Oh, okay. And for that one, I will go to Esther chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Now this has to be one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. That's Esther chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. So to give you a little backdrop, the story of Esther, there's been a law made and all the Jews are to be executed soon. Esther is one of the king's wives, and she's secretly a Jew, and he doesn't know. So her cousin writes her a letter, or her uncle, I guess. I think Mordecai was her uncle. Her uncle writes her a letter and says, please ask the king to reconsider this genocide. Please ask the king to not kill all the Jews. And Esther says, well, I can't do that because if you go into the king's court and he didn't summon you, mm. yeah, he can kill you. Yeah. So she's worried, you know, that if she just walks in there, that it'll be off of her head and it's over. But Mordecai has an interesting message that I think is so inspirational for us today. Starting at verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall there enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So in other words, regardless of what we do, God is always going to be God. God will always come through for us. He never lets us down. He doesn't need us. We need him. 
he would like to work through us. But if you're not going to be part of the solution, he certainly can find someone else. However, if this was supposed to be your moment and you missed it because you chose to sit out, God is not pleased. Amen. Mordecai tells her that if you choose to sit this one out, God is not going to be pleased with you. Don't think that you're just going to escape because you're in the king's house. Mm -hmm. That you can just sit back and watch and say, well, maybe somebody else will save the Jews. It's not God's... God doesn't always come to us in a burning bush. He doesn't always cry out to us from a loud voice in our head. We don't always have a mission. But like Mordecai says, how do you know that you weren't put here for this? For this exact time and this exact moment. And when you get before him on the day, are you going to tell him, well, I was scared. I didn't know if I could. Has God ever sent anybody on a mission he didn't think they, would, they could do? Has God ever set anybody up to fail? Did God say, uh, well, yeah, pick David. I'm not sure if he can do it, but he's probably like our best bet. Right? When God picks you, it's because he knows that you can do this. So my mom, she often says to me that today is not the day and that she is not the one. But I'm here to tell you guys that maybe today is the day. Maybe you are the one. And you can never know if you're not willing to step up. Amen. But if you choose not to step up when you see your chance to do something good, That's right. God is not pleased. And that is where I will leave you for today. Thank you.
Today is the day of your salvation. Tomorrow, it is not promised. If you're not a member of the Church of Christ, you can become a member of the Church of Christ today. The Church of Christ is a church that you can read about in the Bible. And I'm not speaking about the building. This is where we gather and assemble. But the Church of Christ, which is called Ecclesia, is a group of people that have been called out. Who were once who walked in sin and they obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this building is not the church of Christ. You are the church. Somebody says, how can I become a member of the church of Christ? But once again, God has a plan of salvation. A plan that everybody can follow. A plan that if you want to make heaven your home, you've got to be able to go through the word of God. See, I don't have a plan. You don't have a plan. It's God's plan. Yeah. So as how can I become a member of the church of Christ? But Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Right. Once you've heard the Bible, you've got to believe what you heard. Hebrews 11, 6. Then the Bible says you've got to repent. See, that's a plan. God has always given some instructions. you got to repent. And repent is hard. I, I don't know because you know, when you are addicted, have you ever been addicted to anything? People are addicted to sex, and people are addicted to alcohol, people are addicted to drugs, people are addicted to computers, people are addicted to porn, people are addicted, and if you have not been addicted, I'm addicted to food. <laughs> so we got to eat, but I'm not eating what I eat, though. Hmm. I'm on but what I am trying to tell you, though, is that everybody has a vice, and everybody is addicted to something, but you can repent from Jesus Christ and turn your life around. Jesus can help you. He really can help us to turn our lives around. And then the Bible says, once you repent, you must confess in Matthew 10, 32. You can't party all night long. You can't go around treating people like you want to treat. You got to love people right here. You got to serve God right here. You got to obey God right here. Because when you get to judgment, do you really want him to say, depart from me? Wouldn't it be nice to say, come on in here. Can you imagine Jesus at the gate and say, hey, why, why don't you just come on in? Come and get some of this heaven juice that will last for heaven. Come and get your mansion and your robe and your crown that will never fade away. So you got to live a life down here. You can't smoke, drink, gamble, cheat, live, any kind of way. Thank you for going to heaven. Amen. So that's called Amen. living right here. Then the Bible talks about baptism. Brothers and sisters, if you want to be saved, you got to be baptized. Sorry. You can't be sprinkled. You can't be poured. You got to be completely submerged in the water. Amen. And when you're baptized into Christ, there are some blessings in Christ. Oh. Think about it. When we're baptized into Christ, we get remission of sin. Right. What a blessing. As the Bible says in Romans 3.23, we all have sinned and come short. We all have some things that we've done. And then the Bible says that when you're baptized, not only remission of sin, but you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will guide you. And don't you need the Holy Spirit to guide you? Because we can't make decisions. We'll mess up every time. You know, when there's a good thing going on and there's an evil thing going on, the Holy Spirit will help you get through it and say, okay, stay away from the evil thing. Let, let's do the right thing. And so if you're here this morning and you're not a member of the Church of Christ, you can change that today. I'm talking about a church you can read about in the Bible. I'm talking about a church that the Lord purchased with his own blood. Can you imagine all these other denominations out there? Don't you know that the church is not a denomination? Somebody asked me, well, what denomination are you on? We're not a denomination, but a denomination means divided. And Christ is not divided. We're all born in Christ. And I told you this morning that he is a very proper recipe book. And I said, hey, I'm going to give everybody a very proper recipe. And Sunday of next week, go home and follow the recipe. And everybody will come back with a chocolate cake if that's what the recipe was. 
This may be the land. 